Welcome to the Sacred Family Podcast. This is part 7 of the Awake and Arise series, Meek and Lowly in Heart, which is episode 10 of the Sacred Family Podcast. Welcome. This is uh, Bryce Bartell. And Megan Bartell. And this is the Sacred Family Podcast. Mm -hmm. Today we're going to be talking about, uh, uh, the title of the podcast is Meek and Lowly of Heart. So, so far we have talked about the journey of first having a desire to believe, then Uh, being guided by the Comforter or the Holy Ghost, um, identifying true messengers, uh, entering and participating in the preparatory order, uh, overcoming and passing through the trial of faith, uh, entering the Holy Order and uh, what's involved there, and now we're going into meek and lowly of heart. Um, we want to. I want to start off with uh, talking, uh, or reading a scripture in the lectures on faith, and uh, uh, talking about uh, Jesus Christ. So this is lecture seven um, of the lectures on faith, and it says, "But to be a little, but to be a little more particular." Let us ask, where shall we find a prototype into whose likeness we may be assimilated in order that we may be made partakers of life and salvation? Or, in other words, where shall we find a saved being? For if we can find a saved being, we may ascertain without much difficulty what all others must be in order to be saved. They must be like that individual, or they cannot be saved. We think that it will not be a matter of dispute that two beings who are unlike each other cannot both be saved, for whatever constitutes the salvation of one will constitute the salvation of every creature which will be saved. And if we find one saved being in all existence, we may see that all others must be or else not be saved. We ask then, where is the prototype? Or where is the saved being? We conclude as to the answer of this question, there will be no dispute among those who believe the Bible that it is Christ. All will agree in this, that he is the prototype or standard of salvation. Or in other words, that he is a saved being. And if we could continue our interrogation and ask, how is it that he is saved? The answer would be because he is a just and holy being. Uh, And if he were anything different from what he is, he would not be saved. For his salvation depends on his being entirely, being precisely what he is and nothing else. For if we, for if it were possible for him to change in one, in the least degree, so sure he would fail of salvation and lose his dominion, power, authority, and glory, which constitutes salvation. For salvation consists in the glory, authority, majesty, and power, and dominion, which Jehovah possesses, and in nothing else. And no being can possess it but himself or like one like, or one like him. Okay, I'm going to stop there. So... The title of this podcast is Meek and Lowly of Heart, and the beginning of the podcast, we're talking about Christ, Christ being the prototype of the saved man. Um, I want to uh, roll right into one of the epistles um, written by Paul to the Corinthians. Uh, We just read the lectures on faith about how Christ is the prototype of the saved man. In the last podcast, we talked about the holy order, and there's a lot of things involved related to the holy order. 
But let's quote, let me, let's read Paul just for a second and, and tie these two concepts together. Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels and have not charity, I become as a sounding brass or t- a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. And, that, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profits me nothing. Okay. So there are a lot of blessings, a lot of privileges, a lot of experiences that can be um, uh, received through this upward uh, process and through being a part of these different orders, whether you're interacting with angels or interacting with Christ. Um, But Christ is the prototype of the saved man. And if we don't become like Christ, and if we don't uh, follow the path and receive the blessing of having his love in us, which is charity, we are like sounding brass and tinkling cymbals. Um, uh, Or it it, uh, profits us nothing. Um, And that's really where we want to talk today of so what, what do we need to think about? What do we need to be aware of as we start adopting the character um, of, of Christ? Um, I'm going to uh, continue that thought. Um, this is from the Book of Mormon, and it's talking about charity and how charity is directly connected to being meek and lowly of heart. So this is uh, the... Moroni, he's wrapping up the Book of Mormon. There's only two more chapters after this. So this is kind of his uh, signing off um, of uh, the Book of Mormon. And Moroni says, quote, But behold, my beloved brethren, I judge better things of you, for I judge that ye have faith in Christ because of your meekness. For if ye have not faith in him, then ye are not fit to be numbered among the people of his church. And again, my beloved brethren, I'd speak unto you concerning hope. How is it that ye can attain unto faith, save ye have hope? And what is it that ye should hope for? Behold, I say unto you that ye should hope through the atonement of Christ and the power of his resurrection to be raised unto eternal life. And this because of your faith in him, according to the promise. Wherefore, if man have faith, he must needs have hope. For without faith, there cannot be any hope. And again, behold, I say unto you that he cannot have faith and hope, save he shall be meek and lowly of heart. If it's so, his faith and hope is vain, for none is acceptable before God, save the meek and lowly of heart. Okay, so Paul's talking about that you can have, um, you can know the mysteries, you can have prophecy, you can have miracles, you can have a lot of different things. Um, but without charity, uh, it profits you nothing. Mor- Moroni is going in and saying that you can ha- uh, cannot have faith and hope unless you're meek and lowly of heart. Uh, and that none is acceptable before God save the meek and lowly of heart. What then is the relationship between being meek and lowly of heart and having charity? And then what is the relationship between having charity and having uh, follow, be, following the prototype of the safe man, uh, which is Christ? Well, let's, uh, let's actually finish with the next uh, uh, paragraph in Moroni because it connects some dots. And if a man be meek and lowly in, and if a man be meek and lowly in heart and confesses by the power of the Holy Ghost that Jesus is the Christ, he must needs have charity. For if he have not charity, he is nothing. Wherefore he must needs have charity. And then, and charity suffereth long. And this is something uh, 
the list of the attributes of charity, this is common to Moroni's uh, statement as well as Paul's statement. Uh, so both of them are, are uh, connected to each other. And charity suffereth long as, and is kind and envieth not and is not puffed up, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil and rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in truth. Beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, if you have not charity, you are nothing, for charity never faileth. Wherefore, cleave unto charity, which is the greatest of all, for all things must, must fail, but charity is the pure love of Christ, and it endureth forever. And whoso is found possessed of it at the last day, it shall be well with them. Um, well, I'll, I'll actually finish. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, pray unto the Father with all energy of heart, that you may be filled with this love, which he bestoweth, bestoweth upon all who are true followers of his Son, that ye may become the sons of God, that when he shall appear, ye shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is, that we may have this hope, that we may be purified, even as he is pure. Amen. Okay. So at the beginning of this uh, paragraph, it starts connecting between being meek and lowly of heart and having charity. Um, I, you, Moroni is really communicating that these two things are directly related. That charity uh, is potentially a product of being meek and lowly of heart. Um, or is a outflow of being meek and lowly, lowly of heart because we know that charity is a gift um, from God. Uh, so um, is being meek and lowly of heart a qualification to receive charity? Um, and then on the flip side, does charity make someone meek and lowly of heart? They're, they're essentially connected. But uh, we're going to go into this podcast about after everything that we talked about before about, you know, receiving the holy order and doing the work of the covenants and all these, all these different things that could happen, that ultimately without charity and without being meek and lowly of heart, uh, it really profits us nothing. Um, because uh, ultimately we are, we can only be saved if we, if we, uh, um, are like the prototype of the saved man who is meek and lowly of heart. Okay, so I'm going <clears> to <throat> throw in our own example here. Um, we had a, a ha, an aha moment um, a little while ago. And so we had, you know, we had a faith transition um, couple years back and um a lot of that involved trying to communicate what we now believed with our family and during trying to do so um there was a lot of contention within the families on on both sides and um admittedly i i mean i tried we both tried really hard but Admittedly, there was a level of pride on my part, I know at least. And because of that pride, I later had a friend who's like my sister, and she was kind of involved with this whole thing. And she later said to me, um, when you tell me all these things, I, I feel like you are just telling me that you're better than me. And which was not what I was trying to do, but I, we've reflect, I reflected on that a lot through the years, trying to, I guess, see where I went wrong. And we had this aha moment a couple weeks back, and, and we both kind of, I think, realized at the same time that, oh, wait, we didn't really have a huge, we didn't have charity. I didn't have this level of meekness and um or love. I mean, I loved my family, but it was, 
it just, it didn't have that level of charity that was involved, that should have been involved. And without that, everything else was nothing. Like it, it didn't matter what we might have, what spiritual experiences we might have had or what spiritual things might have happened for us or what things we might have learned or it didn't matter if we didn't have charity for our family, for other people around us, if we still had that level of pride thinking even to any degree that we are better than anyone, none of it really mattered. And it, it took us a couple of years to kind of realize that we, that something was missing. Um, but anyway, it's just a, a, a personal experience there that charity matters. <laughs> Excellent. And it's true. I mean, you, you, you forget that, uh, uh, it's not only what you say, but it's how you say it. That's important. But, um, uh, uh, Alma goes into this and he goes into, uh, this, uh, with a group of believers, uh, within the book of Mormon as he's going out and preaching. And Alma says, and now behold, I sit, and now behold, I ask of you, my brethren of the church, have ye been spiritually been have ye spiritually been born of God? Have you received his image in your countenances? Have you experienced this mighty change in your hearts? Do you exercise faith in the redemption of him who created you? Do you look forward with an eye of faith and view this mortal body raised in immortality and this corruption raised in incorruption to stand before God to be judged according to your deeds, which have been done in the mortal body? I say unto you, can you imagine yourself that you hear the voice of the Lord saying unto you in that day, come unto me, blessed for your works have been works of righteousness upon the face of the earth. Or do you imagine to yourself that you can lie unto the Lord at that day and say, Lord, our works have been works upon the face of the earth. Uh, our works have been righteous works upon the face of the earth and that he will save you or otherwise that you can stand. Otherwise that you can imagine yourself brought before the tribunal of God with your souls filled with guilt and remorse, having a remembrance of your, all your guilt, yea, a perfect remembrance of all your wickedness. yea, a remembrance that you've set at defiance, the commandments of God. I say unto you, can you look up to God at that day with a pure heart and clean hands? Uh, I say unto you, can you look up having the image of God engraven upon your countenances? I think the big thing is having this image of God on your countenance. What does that mean? Um, have you ever been in a situation where you have talked to somebody and they have been just angry, angry at you, maybe for a justifiable reason, maybe for a not a justifiable reason, and you can see the anger behind the eyes of the person, um, and you can see the tension that they have. On the flip side, can you see uh, the, uh, the peace that uh, comes behind somebody's eyes when they have the Spirit of Christ with, with them? Um, uh, it, it's there. It's tangible. Um, and Alma is addressing that. So the first thing is being meek. And or we, as we start talking about this, we're talking about Christ as the prototype. Um, and we're talking about uh, having charity. Now, I wanted to sidestep this just for a second because we have a culture of perfection where um, uh, we look and see images on TV of beautiful people and we, we see images of, uh, you know, the best of the best athletes and, and we have a culture of perfection. This isn't what we want to talk about today. We're not talking about being perfect. Um, all fall short of the glory of God in this mortal existence. The only one that came to this earth um, of 
all of God's children that were born to Adam and Eve, uh, who is perfect, is Christ. Um, he's the only one that uh, was perfect in everything. So this isn't about being perfect and having the image of God in your countenance is not about uh, um, being paranoid that you may uh, say or do something that uh, you'll regret. Um, we all will, and we all will until we die. Um, I, the example that I'm showing here in this, uh, this image is, is a, um, an example I like to use or I want to use in this podcast. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie um, Apollo 13, in Apollo 13, and with all of the, the lunar missions, all the Apollo missions, uh, they had to, so after they left the gravitational pull of the Earth and they were in space, they broke apart, their uh, um, rocket broke apart, and they had their, the, the place where they stayed, the pod, and then they had the lunar module, the thing that will guide them to the lunar service. Um, if you remember the movie of Apollo 13, what uh, they had to do is they had to unhook and then rehook. And if, if they, um, when they were rehooking, they would have to keep the lunar module in the window. If they lost it outside of the window, they could miss the lunar module and ultimately uh, uh, the whole mission could be worthless. So they spent a whole lot of time while they were on earth uh, practicing over and over again to make sure that they could reconnect the, the two, uh, um, uh, the two vehicles. Well, the whole point is in the movie, they emphasize that they had to keep the lunar module in the window it may bob back and forth. They may go up, it may go down, but ultimately they needed to keep it in the window. Um, we all fall short of the glory of God. Um, we all will make mistakes. We'll say something or do something or we'll wake up in a bad mood and do something that we're, we regret. But what we want to talk today about is um, having God's image in our countenance uh, having charity, um, following the prototype of the saved man, and keeping the saved man in our window, even though our actions may, you know, necessitate that we're not right on target sometimes. But if we can keep the Savior in our window, uh, we can um, be blessed with charity and be meek and lowly of heart. So another, I guess, way to explain this is our, um, we have a daughter who's very, very hard on herself. She has anxiety and she's just very, um, uh, if she does something wrong, she, she has, she just beats herself up over it. Like it's, uh, it's like the world has ended and she is the worst person on the planet. And she's just, she has a really, really hard time uh, being okay with making mistakes. And uh, yeah. So I really tried to tell her as much as I can that or just remind her she's human and she's never going to be perfect and She's going to make mistakes. The most important thing is where our heart is at. That we're, she's going to, she's going to mess up. But if her heart is pointing towards Jesus Christ or the prototype of the same man, if that's where her heart is pointed, then that's, that's what matters. And sometimes she's going to, her heart's going to shift a little. And, and I, 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 I kind of show this to them that I have a picture of Christ and I point their bodies away from Christ and I kind of give them example of what that what they might be doing in a spiritual sense to have themselves turned away from Christ and then we talk about what to do to turn back and have their bodies or their hearts and their minds pointed back to 
price. And as long as we just get back up and, and keep remembering to, to keep, you know, keep them in our window, keep our hearts pointed towards them. That's, that's what matters. Exactly. And, and before we go on, because the, the rest of this podcast is, is giving examples of um, two prototypes that we want to talk about. One is Christ and one is his mother. Um, and we're just going to be very brief uh, when we talk about his mother. But uh, um, I think the the big thing is when I think of being meek, I think of uh, in the Book of Mormon, Mormon is referred to, and actually... This is uh, the next scripture um, uh, referred to being sober. So this is from uh, the Book of Mormon within the Book of Mormon, chapter 1. And this is describing Mormon. And he says, And now I, Mormon, make a record of the things which I have both seen and heard and call it the Book of Mormon. And about the time that Amaron hid up the records unto the Lord, he came unto me, I, being about 10 years of age, and began to be learned somewhat after the manner of the learning of my people. And Amaron said, I perceive that thou art a sober child and quick to observe. Now, what does it mean to be a sober child and quick to observe? Uh, I don't think uh, uh, Mormon was a boring child. Um, I, I, um, I think we lose the definition of sober in our, our language, but uh, um, perhaps earnest um, and quick to observe. He was quick to recognize his mistake and adjust. Um, uh, at least that's how I view it. That's how I see this scripture, is that he was quick to observe quick to adjust, quick to change, quick to recognize his error and uh, proceed uh, beyond the error. Um, and I think that that, uh, that follows the path of keeping uh, uh, this module in the window, not beating ourselves down. Mormon wasn't perfect, um, but uh, we all have the opportunity uh, to be teachable, recognize our error, and change. Now, the opposite of this, and the opposite really of charity itself, and the opposite of meekness and being meek and lowly of heart is pride. So if you want to look at it that way, instead of saying, you know, I don't know if I could ever be meek and lowly of heart, I don't know if I could ever um, be like Christ, um, perhaps you can look at the opposite and say, you know what, I can overcome my pride um, and I can be teachable and I can be quick to observe. Uh, I think that at, that is a good way to look at it as well. But let's jump into some prototypes, uh, at least two. We wanted to share a prototype of the saved woman and we also wanted the prototype of the saved man. So the prototype of the saved woman is Mary, uh, Mary, the mother of Christ. And uh, um, I want to jump into at least two verses of, uh, or two paragraphs of her. Um, I, before I do this, there was one scripture that was connected to what I just said. And that is Christ saying, then uh, this is in uh, the book of Matthew, chapter six, ver uh, paragraph eight. And then it spoke Jesus saying, come unto me, all you that, all you that are heavy, all you that labor and are and are heavily loaded, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you shall find rest unto your soul, souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So just piggybacking off of uh, uh, what I just said is that ultimately we can be sober. We may not be perfect in this life. Christ is the prototype, but we can um, learn of him. We can quickly adjust. We can pivot, change, 
overcome our pride and have Christ ultimately take the burden of our natural flesh upon himself. Okay, sorry. Now let's go into uh, the prototype of the saved woman. And this is uh, Mary, the mother of Christ. And I'm going to read just uh, two paragraphs related to um, when Mary uh, learned that she was going to be the mother of, of God and her reaction. Uh, this is in the book of Luke, chapter 1. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel came, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee, named Nazareth, to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came in unto her and said, Hell, virgin, who are highly favored of the Lord, the Lord is with you, you are uh, you are chosen and blessed among women. And when she saw the angel, she was troubled at his saying and pondered in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you, you shall conceive and bring forth a son, and his name shall be, and, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. The Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David, and he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom. There shall be no end. Then Mary said unto the angel, how can it be? And the angel answered and said unto her of the Holy ghost and the power of the highest. Therefore also the Holy child shall be born of you shall be called the son of God. And behold, your kinsfolk Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and is the sixth month with her, who is called barren, for with God nothing shall be impossible. And Mary, behold, and Mary said, Behold, the handmaiden of the Lord, be it unto me according to your word, and the angel departed from her. Okay. So I wanted to start with uh, uh, the prototype of the saved woman, which is Mary. Um, and look at her response and her reaction to this news, uh, because I think it has a lot of, uh, um, underpinnings about what type of woman she was. Um, uh, behold the handmaiden of the Lord. Um, we read also, uh, that, uh, in a later verse, that uh, she kept all these sayings in her heart. I think that it communicates a level of humility, a level of meekness. Imagine if an angel of God came to you and said that your child was going to be uh, uh, the son of God and have a kingdom and uh, uh, his kingdom have no end. Would you respond in, you know, how how awesome is that? How, what's the, you know, what's the pride level? What's the, the pride factor that somebody could have, um, with that type of news feeling that, you know, you're going to be special and have some great, great, uh, um, you know, name or, or, uh, uh, achievement or accolade. Uh, but, uh, Mary doesn't respond that way. On the flip side, um, Pride can go both directions, in my opinion. And back in that time, I mean, it, being a pregnant woman um, who was not married, I mean, she could have been stoned. She would, could have been, like, put to death. She could have, like, that. that's not something that you would, that's something that, you could easily be like, oh my gosh, I'm a horrible human being, like in that time period because of the judgment put on you by other people. And you could easily take that to heart and go pridefully in the opposite direction and berate yourself and be like, what did I do wrong to have God do this to me? And 
I mean, she could easily gone in that direction. Whereas I, I don't think, you know, I don't think she did. Like, I think she stayed in that, that level of meekness where she didn't go prideful in either direction. But that's my opinion. Perfect. All right. So, um, I, Continuing down with the prototype of the saved woman, this is now in the Book of Mormon. And this is uh, um, Nephi talking. And he says, uh, this is a vision that Nephi had. And he's seeing uh, the mother of God and he's seeing Christ. And he says, and it came to pass that he said unto me, this is uh, the angel uh, who is showing Nephi these things. Look, and I... And I looked at as if to look upon him, and I saw him not. For he had gone from before my presence, and it came to pass that I looked and beheld the great city of Jerusalem, and also other cities. And I beheld the city of Nazareth, and in the city of Nazareth, Nazareth I beheld a virgin, and she was exceedingly fair and white. And it came to pass that I saw the heavens open, and an angel came down and stood before me, And he said unto me, Nephi, what beholdest thou? And I said unto him, A virgin, most beautiful and fair above all other virgins. And he said unto me, Knowest thou the condescension of God? And I said unto him, I know it that that he loveth his children. Nevertheless, I do not know the meaning of all things. And he said unto me, Behold, the virgin whom thou seest is the mother of the Son of God, after the manner of the flesh. It came to pass that I beheld that she was carried away in the spirit. Now we know from uh, um, this experience that uh, the angel is talking about a condescension um, or someone um, choosing to come to a lower state of state. um, uh, And this is specifically talking about Mary, the mother of God. So in addition to this, Mary gave up uh, something that was great, uh, an exaltation, a high estate to come down into this world um, and uh, become a, a mortal and um, be the mother of the Son of God. So we learn about the prototype of the saved woman. Um, in addition to that, I, um, we can... Uh, see her reaction. So uh, the next thing is talking about Christ. We have a lot of detail about the prototype of the saved man. The first thing that we wanted to talk about related to his meekness and his humility, or excuse me, his meekness and his lowly of heart, is uh, what manner of entry did Christ uh, come into the world? Uh, And we're going to read a quick verse about that. And it came to pass, this is in Luke uh, chapter 2, and it came to pass in those days there went out a decree among Caesar Augustus that all his empire should be taxed. This same taxing was when Cyrenius was governor of Syria, and all went to be taxed, every one to his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was the house, he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary his betrothed wife, he she being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered, and she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger, because there was none to give him room for them in the inns. So as we start looking at the very beginning of Christ's mortal uh, ministry um, or coming to this earth, the manner by which he came into this world uh, communicates the character and humility that he has. Um, Because he he was God before he was born and he could have entered this a state any manner that he wanted, but he chose obscurity. He chose um, humility 
and he chose uh, from the beginning to be rejected and cast out, um, not being accepted in the ends. In addition to that, um, him being the son of God, uh, the father of heaven and earth, who was the ones who greeted him? Who, who were the ones who came to worship him? And this is where the next paragraph goes into. And there were in the same country shepherds staying out in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. But the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring unto you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this is the way you shall find, and this is the way you shall find the babe. He is wrapped in swaddling clothes, and is lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, on earth peace, goodwill to men. So um, not only did he enter and was born in humility, but it was the meek and lowly of heart, the shepherds, who uh, came to worship him. So this, this communicates to us uh, a lot about his character. Also, kind of offhandedly, it communicates that um, who's going to recognize him, that, you know, likeness recognizes those that are of the same likeness. So meekness recognizes meekness. And so if we are to recognize Christ in our own life or recognize who he is, uh, like if we are to go to him and recognize him, uh, we too must be like as he is. We likeness will recognize likeness. So, you know. no, I think that's great. I think uh, that thought's perfect in the sense that um, if you're doubting your value, if you're uh, anxious about trying to be the prototype of the saved man or the prototype of the saved woman, you're already on the right path if you recognize Christ in your life and if you're seeking after him. And if you're seeking after, uh, um, would you be comfortable and would you find yourself in the fields with the, the shepherds? Um, I. Or would you see yourself somewhere else? Um, I think that you can, you alone can give that uh, um, answer, but uh, perhaps maybe you're not as far off as you think you are. And that uh, um, if you are listening to a podcast like this or reading a book like this, um, maybe your likeness is closer than you think it is to the prototype of the saved woman and the prototype of the saved man. Um, but, uh, uh, in humility, uh, Christ came into this world. Now let's look at Christ's, um, ministry. Uh, before he began his ministry, uh, he submitted himself to be baptized of John the Baptist. Now this is significant because he's submitting himself to be baptized of someone else from someone else. Um, even though he was God over all creation, uh, he allowed himself uh, to, to do that. So let, let's quickly read that. The first uh, uh, paragraph that we're going to read related to that is from Matthew chapter 2. And it says uh, in paragraph 4, And then came Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John refused him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you. And why do you come to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer me to be baptized of you, for thus it becomes us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him, and John went down into the water and baptized him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up immediately out of the water. And John saw, and behold, the heavens were opened unto him. 
And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon Jesus. And behold, he heard the voice from heaven saying, You are my son, this day I have begotten you. I think this uh, communicates who Christ was. Um, John uh, first refused Christ, and Christ, recognizing that, yes, he was perfect, yes, he probably, uh, without the command of God, didn't need to be baptized, but there was a command from the Father, and for him to fulfill all righteousness, he did need to submit. Um, There are things in this life that you may not uh, completely understand or agree with um, or, you know, uh, think about whether it is um, sacrament or, you know, whatever it may be. Uh, Submitting to those things uh, that are scriptural, that are from heaven, um, Christ did it to fulfill our righteousness And it communicates the humility and meekness that we have to do as well. Uh, This is from the second book of Nephi. Nephi is talking to the Father and Christ about this. And uh, in uh, uh, 2 Nephi 13, chapter 2, it says, And now, if the Lamb of God, he being holy, have need to be baptized by water to fulfill all righteousness, oh, then how much more need have we, being unholy, to be baptized even by water? And now I would ask of you, my beloved brethren, wherein the Lamb of God did fulfill all righteousness in being baptized by water? Know ye not that he was holy? But notwithstanding he being holy, he showeth unto the children of men that according to the flesh he humbleth himself before the Father, and witnesseth unto the Father that he would be obedient unto him in keeping his commandments. Wherefore, after he was baptized with water, the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove, And again, it showeth unto the children of men the straightness of the path and the narrowness of the gate by which ye should enter, he having set the example before them. And he said unto the children of men, Follow thou me. Okay. Christ showed the way. He humbled himself before the Father. He was willing to do what the Father commanded in all things. Um not only was Christ quick to observe, but uh, uh, he, uh, he did it perfectly. And he, he um, had the Father's um, uh, command and, and his actions always at mind in mind. Okay? So the next thing about Christ is... Not only did he subject himself to the spiritual requirements or the spiritual direction of the Father, but he also subjected his own flesh. Um, And he showed us uh, that it is possible to subject the flesh. Um, That is, it is possible to um, overcome the lusts of the flesh. Now, this is a, a picture of Christ in his uh, 40 days in the wilderness after his baptism. Uh, but um, uh, let's read a little bit about this, um, um, uh, this t- temptation that he had. And this is in the book of Luke, chapter 3, uh, paragraph 10 and 11. It says, And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan. And it was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. And after forty days the devil came unto him to tempt him. And in those days he did eat nothing, and when he had ended, he afterward hungered. And the devil said unto him, If you are the Son of God, command the stone that it may be made bread. And Jesus answered him, saying, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the Spirit took him up to a high mountain. And he beheld all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, and said, came unto him, and said unto him, All this power will I give unto you, and the glory of them, for they are delivered unto me, and to whomever I desire I give them. If you therefore will worship me, all shall be yours. Jesus answered and said unto him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. 
And the spirit brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple. And the devil came unto him and said, If you are the son of God, cast yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to, to keep you. And in his hands they shall bear you up, lest at any time you dash your foot against a, a stone. And Jesus answered said unto him, It is written, You shall not test the Lord your God. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. Now, what I want to point out here, which is typically not pointed out um, when this, these experiences are reviewed, is that Christ was in a position of knowledge where he could detect the, uh, the adversary um, and detect the, impl- the, the temptations of the adversary. Um, meekness and humility are require knowledge uh you can pretend unto humility and you can pretend unto meekness but if your meekness your your uh, supposed meekness and your supposed humility is in ignorance or in error you're 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 not that's not helpful um that's not going to produce the results that you're looking for but Christ had the knowledge, but then he also had the ability to subject the flesh, subject the temptation, and overcome. And that gives us an example moving forward that it is possible to do that. Um, what, I always, what I like to think about as I think about temptations of the flesh is many times it is like a science project where you can self analyze well why did i get angry at this why was this why was this a temptation why did um i i react this way why did uh, um this uh, tempt me that way um i think that the analysis and the humility and the meekness to do a self evaluation uh is a uh, uh is a a communicates a level of meekness and lowly of heart. Um, continuing on, in addition to subjecting the flesh, uh, Christ did only what the Father did, uh, what he saw the Father do. Um, what I mean by that is that uh, he didn't go beyond what he was supposed to do, and he didn't uh, lack what he should do. Um, this is Christ in the uh, book of the test, uh, book of John, chapter five. Said then answered Jesus and said unto them, Truly, truly, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever things he does, the Son likewise do, likewise does these also. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he desires. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son, that all should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who honors not the Son honors not the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say unto to you, he who hears my word and believes on him who sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Um, one of the things I want to highlight here is that meekness and following the prototype of the safe man and having charity requires you to follow the right person. Uh, we talked about... Uh, um, Where's Waldo when it comes to true messengers? But when we are looking at uh, the image that we need to have in our countenance, um, the image is Christ, and we need to have Christ in our countenance. Uh, Following the lectures on faith, that is why we need to uh, know the correct character perfections and attributes of Christ. 
Uh, Christ followed the Father perfectly. He followed the Father in thoughts, in words, and in deeds. Um, most of us, uh, for me personally, I'm just trying to get the deeds correct. Uh, that typically is an error. Uh, getting the thoughts and the words correct are, are a bigger struggle. Um, but uh, Christ followed the, the Father alone perfectly. Um, and then Christ, being the Word, uh, is the direct image of the Father. So if we can follow Christ perfectly, or if we can follow Christ, uh, we will ultimately follow the Father. Um, meekness and lowly of heart means knowing who Christ is and doing our best to be quick to observe uh, the image of Christ. Okay. I have an example. It might sound roundabout, but I promise I can expect. Oh, okay. Sorry. So, um, there was an individual um, who uh, told me something that it affected me um, in a hurtful way. And in my personal not so humble opinion. I was convinced that they were being deceived, that they were not following what God wanted them to do because what they were doing was not charitable. And it's, I was going to set out to explain exactly why she was not following Christ because of this and this and this and how it was uncharitable what she was doing and so i i was i set out to tell her exactly what i thought of that and um tried to convince her that she was not following what christ really wanted her to do so in the process um thankfully i stopped myself and i decided to pray and um i asked god to give me the words to tell her. And I, I was convinced God was going to tell me one thing and um, God told me a much different thing. And the thing that came to my mind was when I was going through this fat faith transition, um, the same individual told me over and over and over again that I was deceived and I was following Satan and um, I was not following God and it hurt a lot and I was very upset by it because I knew I wasn't and but God brought to my mind that I was doing the exact same thing to her whether or not she was or wasn't it wasn't up for me to say because if I did so, I was doing the exact same thing she did to me. And which, in the end, it was a very prideful mindset that I know better than you, and I'm going to tell you what you are doing wrong. And so what it came back to was I could only control myself. And the only thing that I could do was make sure that I was following what God wanted me to do. And I was following the right person. Um, and that I was going back to what does my father want me to do? And am I doing that? And it wasn't a matter of telling somebody else that they should or shouldn't. Um, but setting the example. And when I finally clicked that that's what charity is, is it's not putting a judgment on somebody else. It's not judging them or telling them what they should or shouldn't do. Because um, in the end, that's just pride. And what you really, what charity really is, is, well, there's a lot of things that charity is, but at least in the end with that situation, it was me, myself, doing what 
I was accusing her of not doing, I guess. <laughs> anyway, it was me, myself, following father completely and loving her and not trying to judge her um, and just loving her. Anyway, if, it, it came back eventually. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Okay, so um, I... Uh, going into this, Christ did exactly what the Father did. Um, and uh, going right into kind of what Megan was just talking about is having compassion. Um, compassion is a big word. And if, if you think about what Megan just talked about with charity, charity suffereth long and is kind, envieth not, is not puffed up, seeketh not her own. The thing about all of those things and compassion is uh, they're internal and external. Um, when we're talking about uh, being meek and lowly of heart, it's not an action alone. Um, it would produce an action, but uh, it is a, uh, goes back to being the state of being or it is a, um, uh, a condition by which you're living. So Christ, uh, uh, this is uh, the bread and the fish example, and I'm going to read it. Um, this is from the book of Mark, chapter, chapter 4, paragraph 15 and 16. In those days, the multitude being very great and having nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples and said unto them, I have compassion on the multitude because they have now been with me three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away fasting to their own houses, they will faint by the way, for some of them came from afar. And his disciples answered him, From where can a man satisfy these? So great a multitude with bread here in the wilderness? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he commanded the people to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves and gave thanks, and broke and gave to his disciples to set before the people. And they did set them before the people, and they had a few small fishes. And he blessed them and commanded to set them also before the people, and they should eat. So they did eat and were filled, and they took up the broken bread that was left, seven baskets, and they that had eaten were about four thousand, and he sent them away. Um, as we start thinking about being meek and lowly of heart and, and putting the image of Christ in our countenance, um, compassion, having compassion on others is, uh, uh, a significant step in that direction. I don't think it is possible, um, to be meek and lowly of heart without having compassion towards others. Um, and compassion is more than just feeling bad for someone. Um, compassion is more than, uh, um, uh, hoping someone, uh, um, does better. There's a story of Joseph Smith. Um, I believe this was in Kirtland. Uh, somebody in the, the church, their house burned down. And they were talking about it uh, at a meeting, a church meeting, a priesthood meeting, the next day. And uh, they were talking about how sad they felt about the person uh, and their house. And Joseph, Smith's, Joseph Smith said something, something to the effect of, I feel bad, I feel $50 bad for this person. How much do you feel bad for this person? And... Uh, I think that the idea is that uh, um, compassion requires action. Okay. All right. And that uh, leads us right into um, the next thing. And this is the, a picture of the Good Samaritan. Um, and the story of the Good Samaritan really communicates charity um, and compassion and this action and this attitude. Um, I, being meek and lowly of heart is and the countenance and the spirit that we operate under um, uh, communicates our attitude as well. 
So going into the, um, uh, I'm going to skip this, going into the uh, uh, Good Samaritan, um, this is from Luke chapter 8. And Jesus answer said, and Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side of the way. And likewise, a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked upon him and passed by the other way, the other side of the way, for they desired in their hearts that it might not be known that they had seen him. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him, and went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him in him to an inn and took care of him and on the next day when he departed he took money and gave to the host and said unto him take care of him and whatever you spend more when i come again i will repay you and now of these three do you think was neighbor unto him who fell among thieves and he said he who showed him mercy then said jesus unto him go and do likewise um we talk about mercy a lot. Um, uh, if you're wrestling and get somebody in a chokehold, they may, uh, you know, tap on the, the mat, you know, mercy, mercy. Um, what I like to highlight on this, instead of highlighting the mercy, is actually highlighting um, for they desired in their heart that it might not be known that they had seen him. I think ultimately, as we start thinking about having the image of Christ in our countenance, being meek and lowly of heart and having charity, it's related to the condition of our heart, um, not necessarily your blood glucose level and not necessarily your uh, cholesterol level, but uh, considering what is inside you and how you operate and the condition of the spirit that resides within you. Um, ultimately, if that condition is good, you will naturally be merciful. That'll, that'll just be a natural byproduct of the condition of your spirit and your heart. Um, I don't think, implied in this story, I don't think the Good Samaritan sat on his horse debating um, you know, should I do this? Should I do not? Should I do this? Should I do that? But it was a natural instinct within the Good Samaritan's uh, behavior, attitude, and character to do to take care of uh, this person on the road um, that was beaten. Being. Um. Okay. So I've heard once or twice before that uh, the story of the Good Samaritan could be thought of in a slightly different way. And um, I want to bring that up because I have a couple of other things to say about it. Anyway, um, I've heard that it could be considered that, or think of, consider that the Good Samaritan is Christ. And um the person hurt is the only is the world basically it's all of us it's every one of us and that the other people who pass by um it wasn't within their power to to help that person um because they hadn't reached the the level of knowledge and wisdom that Christ had. And so I'm going to bring that into, um, I, I've thought a lot recently just about the, the word pure love of Christ has really come into my mind a lot recently because I've, I've thought about different people and I thought, you know, they, they do, 
they do love me um, to their to the level of their ability to love they love me and when I say that I, I don't mean that in a mean derogatory way I mean that in I don't think they have the knowledge or have reached a level of um, of, of knowledge to be able to love in the in a certain way, uh, especially not in the way none of us love in the way that Jesus loves. No, none of us have reached that level um, because he it's a pure love, and and it's that word. I don't think is to be used lightly. That word means what it says. It is pure. And nobody is pure. No human is pure. So nobody can love with the pure love of Christ without him helping you. Um, because it's, it's not within our power. And that's what, how I'm bringing it back to this, that way of thinking of the Good Samaritan is that It is only within his power to love with that pure love because he is the only person who has reached that level of wisdom and knowledge, that that level of experience and um, to know how to love so purely and perfectly. And, And so that's what we're trying to attain to, but we have to, we have to learn and we have to go through experience and through, um, we have to learn, we have to grow <laughs> to be able to attain to that level of love and love as he loves. And in the meantime, um, we turn to him to help us, help us do so, or, you know, help us more. Excellent. Perfect. And I like that example. I think, uh, um, you know, as we are uh, doing the best that we can and having compassion on others um, and seeing that others are doing the best that they can as well, um, ultimately that is uh, charity. All right. So the next is... uh, um, we wanted to highlight the manner by which Christ uh, interacted with people because meek and lowly of heart is not a psychotherapy. It's not a behavior technique. Uh, it isn't a um, method or a something that you can get from a self-help book or how to... Um, you know, tactically um, communicate with someone. Uh, It all is coming from the heart. It is a manner of uh, condition or the quality of spirit that you are allowing to occupy within you. And as a result of that, the behavior that you uh, exist, the behavior that is existing within you, or excuse me, The behavior that you have towards others is a reflection of ultimately what is within you. Um, There's a lot of um, individuals out there that can deceive, that can put up a face, but ultimately, as Christ said, are ravening wolves. But when you truly are meek and lowly of heart and you have charity, and you have Christ's image in your countenance, uh, it uh, manifests itself in your behavior with others. So we wanted to highlight one instance that we think highlights Christ's uh, behavior, and that is his interaction with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is a leader of the Jews. He is uh, not uh, you know, uh, on uh, the bandwagon at this point. Um, He's coming um, to Christ at night. He's secretive, um, uh, which can communicate his nervousness, his skepticism. Um, And Christ's behavior 
and his approach to Nicodemus communicates the spirit that Christ uh, manifests. And it says uh, here in uh, John chapter 2, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no man can, can do these miracles which you do except God be with him. Jesus answered him, answered and said unto him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into the mother's womb and be born? Um, and if you think about this, this answer um, or this question from Nicodemus, um, you can kind of look at it and say this is a no-brainer. This is, you know, you, you're, 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 an, you're asking a question that you already know the answer to. And for me, I'd probably get frustrated or annoyed. Um, and I guess that is a reflection of the spirit by which I operate. But uh, Christ uh, is patient and he exhibits uh, charity and brotherly kindness. And Christ, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it desires, and you hear the sound thereof, but cannot tell from where it comes and to where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answered and said unto him, how can these things be? And Jesus answered and said, Are you a master of Israel and do not know these things? Truly, truly, I say unto you, we speak that which we do know and testify that which we have seen, and you receive not our witness. If I have told you of earthly things you and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Okay. So I'm just going to stop there. Um, uh, the The purpose of reading this is, to communicate the, the, the pattern by which or the, the reflection by which or the spirit by which Christ operates, uh, cr operates under and how that uh, communicates his meekness and his lowliness of heart. Um, uh, continuing on, um, I, Christ when, uh, with his meekness and lowliest, lowliness of heart that also exhibits a power, and he was full of virtue as well. Um, you cannot have one without the other. You cannot be unvirtuous and also be meek and lowly of heart. Um, I, it is kind of a package deal. Uh, so let's go into this. Um, and Well, I'll, I'll talk about this after... This is uh, Mark chapter 3. And a certain woman who had a discharge of blood 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, she came in the crowd behind and touched his garment. For she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I may be whole. And immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up and she felt in body that she had been healed of the plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that virtue had gone out of him, turned unto him in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Um, and then we read in the, the rest of this that uh, uh, the woman said it was me, and, and uh, uh, Christ uh, said that she was healed and, and um, good from there. But the thing that I wanted to highlight here is that virtue was a power in Christ. Now, why would virtue and being meek and lowly of heart be connected? I want to make a suggestion that it is all based off of the quality of our spirit. Um, the quality of our spirit and the spirit by which we operate under um, naturally has a power. If we're not virtuous, that ultimately affects the quality of our spirit. Um, and reflects the, the power by which we can receive strength from the Lord. All right. In addition to that, um, I, Christ instructed us to be like a child, um, and that 
um, central to becoming a part of the kingdom of God is to return back to being a child. Now, there's an interesting dichotomy there in the sense that um, we're not supposed to be childlike in the sense that we're, we throw food at each other and we um, you know, have temper tantrums and things like that, but that we should be like a child. So let's read a quick uh, scripture about that. Uh, this is from uh, Matthew chapter 9, paragraph 10. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the middle of them and said, Truly I say unto you, except you are converted and become as, a little, as little children, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Where whoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same as the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever shall receive one such little child in my name receives me. But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for him that a millstone were hung around his neck and he drowned in the depths of the sea. Now, Christ is not telling us to be childish. Uh, Paul, even in the letters of the New Testament, say that uh, um, that I was a, and this is actually before uh, uh, he talks about charity, uh, coincidentally. Uh, he says that, uh, to paraphrase it, that when I was a child, I spake as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. So it's not necessarily being a child, being childish, but it's to be a child. Now, how does that relate to the kingdom of heaven? Because Christ is talking directly in this verse about such is the kingdom of heaven. I, I want to make a suggestion that it is related to what we've talked about already about being quick to observe, to being teachable. The thing about children is that they recognize that they lack knowledge. I don't know how many times my daughter has asked, well, I was a uh, putting her to bed about a week ago and I was waiting for her to get done in the bathroom and she asked about five questions, five why questions. Uh, why does the door shut? Why is the sky blue? Why is this and why is that? And she sincerely wanted to know the, the answers to those questions. Um, I, as we think about moving forward, um, as we think about having the lunar module in our window, um, it is okay and encouraged to be childlike and constantly ask why. Why did this temptation uh, occur? Why is God asking me to, be, uh, uh, to do this specific commandment? Why should I observe the sabbath day why should i and you can keep on filling in the blanks god does not have any problem with you asking why um, and encourages us to overcome darkness and error and ignorance through seeking light and truth and the only way to seek light and truth is to seek out the why questions. So being teachable and, and like a child is part of being part of the kingdom of God. The next thing uh, to follow the example of Christ, uh, to continue down the prototype of the saved man, uh, Christ is the judge of all. But if you look at him in the New Testament, he didn't judge. Uh, he didn't judge the wicked. Uh, except uh, the unrighteous leadership um, so that they could uh, get mad at him and put him to death. But uh, if you look at uh, everywhere else, instead of judging the uh, sinner and the harlot and the adulterer and the adulterist, uh, he is doing... He, he is... Um, uh, offering uh, mercy uh, more than judgment. 
So this is uh, in the test. This is in the testimony of John chapter six and uh, ver- paragraph 11. Early in the morning, he, he, that is Christ, came again to the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. And the scribes and the Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, middle of the people, they said unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they, that they might have to, to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger rode on the ground. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and rode on the ground. And they who heard it, being convicted by their own consciousness, went out one by one, being at the eldest, even unto the last. Um, This goes back to compassion and the condition of our spirit. Uh, When your spirit is not... When you are in a, uh, when you are agitated, when you are following uh, an incorrect spirit, there is a um, a tendency to judge, to want to judge, to want to criticize, to want to condemn. Um, Christ was the opposite of that. He uh, avoided at all possible um, judgment and condemnation and when all possible provided mercy. Um, And that uh, follows the prototype of the saved man. Now going right to that, there is the opposite. He did, um, he did uh, provide judgment when needed. But if you look at the story This is Christ cleansing the temple. He was slow to wrath. Um, So let's read that and let's talk about it just for a second because it is important to have that balance. Um, This is uh, John chapter 1. And uh, it says, After this he went went down to Camberdom, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples. And they continued there not many days. And the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and sheep and doves and changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the money cha- the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And we have said unto them who sold doves, Take these things from here, make not my father's house a house of merchandise. And his disciples remembered what it it was written. The zeal of our house was eaten, has eaten me up. Now there is a dichotomy here where Christ is getting uh, uh, questioned by the leadership of the Jews for eating dinner with sinners and publicans. And in that dinner, Christ is saying um, the the sick have no need of a physician, alluding to that the sinners and publicans needed his help. He was the physician and could, um, like Megan talked about, uh, he had the knowledge and wisdom to succor those who were sinners and that he could help them out. Now, the opposite of that is he is in what is supposed to be a holy place, a temple, and he is not going in there as a wild man yelling and screaming at everyone. That's not what it says. It says that he, uh, after he made a scourge of small cords, which means that there was time, there was thinking, there was a method, uh, there was uh, deliberateness in his action. He cleansed what was supposed to be holy um, away from sinners. So meekness and uh, 
righteousness, righteousness is doing what is right uh, when um, con- con- uh, confronted with something that is wrong or abuse that is holy. Um, it is not to be a wilting flower. It is not to be a limp-wristed, um, uh, uh, kindly fellow ignoring what uh, is um, uh, being abused, but actually to standing up for what is right. So that is not, uh, uh, righteousness is also meek and lowly. But at the same time, not contentious. It's a balance. I think it's, um, that's, that's something that I think the world tries to ignore that there is a balance in all things and that there should be. And that's what Christ ultimately was. He was the perfect balance of everything. And it's what the scriptures are trying to show is that he was this, this perfect balance. And I, that's why I see meekness and lowliness of heart as is this perfect balance of um, no pride and this, perfect balance of um being righteous and having judgment but still no contention and uh having love too i don't know it's it's there's so much to learn about balance but that's perfect exactly perfect okay so he was slow to wrath Um, and what he did do is he made himself less than everyone else. Now we go into he that exalteth himself shall be abased and he that abaseth himself shall be exalted. And we started off talking about Christ, about how he entered this world. He entered this world, not in a palace, uh, not on a throne in a palace, um, not, uh, uh, in front of uh, uh, armies and navies and and uh, um, glory and and festivals and things like that, uh, he entered this world in a manger, and his uh, um, welcome party were shepherds. Um, uh, he set the example for his uh, disciples as well. And after he poured into a basin and began to wash the feet of the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded, then comes he to P- Simon Peter. And Peter said unto him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do you do not know now, but you shall know hereafter. Peter says unto him, You do not, you do not need to wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I wash not, you not, you have no part with me. Simon Peter says unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus says to him, he that has washed his hands and his head needs not save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit. And you are clean, but not all. Now this was the custom of the Jews under their law. Wherefore Jesus did this, that the law might be fulfilled, which he knew who should betray him. Therefore he said, you are not all clean. Okay. Um. So Christ uh, washed the feet of his disciples as an act to illustrate that uh, if you are in the employ of the Lord and if you are to be meek and lowly and follow the example and prototype of Christ, uh, the Christ, Christ is a servant. And for those who want to follow him are also servants as well. But Christ made himself less than others. In addition to that, uh, Christ was not greedy. Um, He desired all who followed him to receive the same blessings as he did. Uh, So after he washed the feet of his disciples, he went out and gave what is called the intercessory prayer. And this is in John chapter 9. Jesus spoke these words and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you as you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many 
as you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work which you gave me to do. And now, O Father, glorify me with your own self, with, with the glory which I have given you before the world was. I have manifested your name unto the men whom you, have give, whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever you have given me are of you, for I have given unto them the words which you gave me, and they received them, and have known surely that I came out from you, and they have believed that you did send me. I pray for them, I pray not for the world, but for them whom you have given me. For they are yours, and all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And now I am no more in the world, but these are in the world, and I come to you. Holy Father, keep through your own name those whom you have given me, that they may be agreed as one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture may be fulfilled. Okay, so Christ, he finishes uh, the um, washing the feet of his disciples, and then uh, he goes and gives the intercessory prayer. Um, this is uh, essentially one of the last things that he does, if not the last thing that he does, before he goes into the Garden of Gethsemane to perform the atonement, and then uh, afterward uh, gets scourged and crucified. His last plea to the Lord is that those who follow him will receive uh, the same blessing that he has. Christ was unselfish. He wasn't greedy. He wasn't looking to uh, have his, uh, you know, uh, his thing over here and then uh, uh, um, not, uh, you know, the other people have uh, their stuff over there. Um, his pile is right here. Your pile is right there. And he's not going to divide it up. But Christ freely gave what was given to him. Um, the next thing, he did suffer the will of the Father. So um, one of the things before I go into this next scripture is um, um, I, when you look at the suffering in the Garden of Gethsemane and you look at the character of Christ, Christ um, and you think about yourself, uh, it doesn't appear to me through the scriptures that Christ was excited about this or looking forward to this. He wasn't running, uh, you know, full head on um, to, to suffer. Um, he even asked the Lord that uh, the cup would be passed from him. Um, when we go through trials and when we have to suffer the will of the Father, whether it's losing a loved one, losing a job, uh, whatever it may be, uh, being meek and lowly of heart and having in the image of Christ doesn't mean that we have to be happy about it. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to uh, um, sing kumbaya. We can like Christ, desire it to be passed from us and still be fine in the face of the Lord. It's, are we willing to pass through it without being angry at God or uh, doubting or um, uh, uh, succumbing to any evil influences as we go through it? Um, I think in a similar light, um, I had a conversation with God a while back and I was feeling guilty for feeling hurt about something that someone had done. And God was very clear that it's not a sin to have hurt feelings. It's not a sin to be sad. It's not, it's not a sin to say like this, this hurt me and I'm sad and I'm, or, you know, to even be like, I don't like this. Just like as Bryce was saying, um, 
It's just the acting on it. It's where's your heart um, while it hurts. If my heart turned to wanting to hurt, turn that hurt back on that person, that's when the, you know, the thing comes in, like, where's your heart at? While you may not be happy at what's going on, you, God had a willing, or Christ had a willingness to do his desire to do what the father wanted, um, overshadowed the, his own desires. And that's where his heart was truly at. I think of, uh, my, you know, wrestling in high school, I wrestled in high school and, uh, we would, uh, at the beginning of the wrestling season, we would have two a days. So we'd get to the school at five 30 in the morning and do wind sprints and ladders and, and pushups and things like that for an hour. And then we'd get ready for school and then we'd have wrestling practice after school. And then, um, on days that we didn't have, uh, uh, or weeks that we didn't have wrestling tournaments, we, after practice, would do wind sprints. And nobody likes wind sprints, and nobody likes two-a-days. Um, it's not something that we embrace. Uh, we uh, um, don't uh, typically thank our coach for uh, having us go through it, um, but we also don't curse our coach for making us go through it. And I think that's the difference, is like, you don't have to love the trial. Uh, it doesn't have to be something that you uh, look forward to and uh, um, hold on to. Um, you don't have to uh, love the abuse that you've been given. But uh, um, uh, I think this is where we go into becoming like a child. Uh, uh, King Benjamin talks about this, becoming submissive, meek, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things which the Lord seeth fit to afflict upon us even as a child to submit to their father. Um, this means that we're willing to go through it and we recognize that God has a bigger picture. Um, and uh, I, this is uh, educating us or uh, building our resistance um, like uh, wind sprints uh, uh, for wrestling or two a days. It's building our strength and our resistance. Um, so Christ was willing to go through um, what the father, uh, um, uh, required him to. And the scripture here is actually not from the Garden of Gethsemane um, where he asked for the cup to be passed. What, I, what we wanted to highlight is Christ's attitude as he was going through it. Uh, this is John chapter 10. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered him, Do you say this thing of yourself, or did others tell it to you of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and your chief priests have delivered you unto me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would my servants fight that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from here. Pilate therefore said unto him, Are you a king then? Jesus answered and said that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate says, says unto him, What is truth? So I, I, we wanted to highlight Christ's behavior during this trial that he, at the beginning of it, personally asked to be passed but he suffered the will of the father. Um, his attitude, I think of my reaction because I am not Christ. I would probably say, well, what do you think? You saying something sarcastic and maybe saying, duh, um, and uh, something uh, mean or crass or something back to Pilate. But Christ, after suffering in the garden of Gethsemane um, is standing there. Uh, the, real uh, king and uh, God of heaven and earth patiently, like with Nicodemus, uh, talking through, um, talking to Pilate 
uh, in a humble and meek way instead of uh, maybe lashing out like I would do. But uh, um, that, again, illustrates the prototype of the safe man. Um, in addition to that, in that manner, Christ blessed Pilate versus cursing him. Uh, he could have lashed out at Pilate. He could have condemned Pilate. He could have cursed Pilate. But uh, the, the one who had authority to kill or not kill Christ, he blessed him instead of cursing him. All right. Next of all, um, you probably uh, uh, have uh, noticed uh, through uh, these podcasts that I like uh, the road to Emmaus because I think I've we've uh, referenced the road to Emmaus three or four times already. But uh, I'm not going to read through it. Um, I just want to uh, highlight it, uh, highlighting the character of Christ. Uh, who vaunts not itself, uh, or vaunts not himself. So this is Christ. This is the the first witness of Christ's resurrection was Mary um, Magdalene uh, in the garden. The second um, witnesses were uh, the two on the road to Emmaus. Now this is after Christ had achieved what only the Father had achieved. Nobody, no, none of Father's children had achieved what Christ had achieved. Um, again, thinking about my reaction, I would probably, uh, be talking up a storm and talking about how cool I was and uh, all the cool things that I just did and how I was so much better than everybody else and all these other things. But Christ, if you read the road to Emmaus really illustrates, um, what, uh, character, um, uh, and what a meek and lowly person uh, uh, acts like he was uh, um, patient. Uh, he wasn't. Uh, he was wasn't presumptive. Uh, he um, didn't even have them s- noticed him until the very end when they invited him into their house. So as we start thinking about what this looks like, um, Christ truly is the prototype of the saved man. He is also endlessly patient. And uh, the example here is uh, doubting Thomas or Thomas. Um, and I'm going to actually, I'm going to read that uh, scripture. And uh, um, that's out of order. Um, and that's out of order. Okay. Um, sorry, we're skipping through qu- quite a few of these because some of them were out of order. Um, but Thomas, one of the 12 called uh, Diamus, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But but he said unto them, Except I shall see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger in the print of the nails, and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. After eight days again his disciples were with him, and Thomas with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst, and said, Peace be unto you. Then says he to Thomas, reach here your finger and behold my hands and reach here your hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but, but believing. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God, Jesus says unto him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed, but are blessed are they that have not seen and yet believe, have believed. So Christ also was endlessly patient uh, and He took every opportunity to educate and teach um, uh, instead of uh, being frustrated and annoyed. Um, The last two things that we want to talk about is how individual Christ is in his relationships. Um, They are individual. And uh, the picture here comes from the Book of Mormon when he visits or is an illustration of an event in the Book of Mormon when he visits them after his ascension uh, from uh, 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 that you find in the Book of Acts. And this is uh, the Book of Third Nephi uh, in the Book of Mormon. 
And it says, And it came to pass that the Lord came, spake unto them, saying, Arise and come forth unto me, that ye may thrust your hand into my side, and also that ye may feel the prints of the nails in my hands and in my feet, that ye may know that I am the God of Israel and the God of the whole earth, and have been slain for the sins of the world. And it came to pass that the multitude went forth and thrust their hands into his side, and did feel the prints of the nails of his hands and in his feet. And this they did do, going forth one by one, until they had all gone forth, and did see with their eyes, and did feel with their hands, and did know of a surety, and did bear record that it was he, for whom it was written by the prophets, that should come, and that when they had all gone forth and had witnessed for themselves, they did cry out with one accord, saying, Hosanna, blessed be the name of the Most High God, and they did fall down at the feet of Jesus, and did worship him. Um. Christ is individual. Um, the ministry and the assistance and the suckering that he gives one person is not what he'll give another person. Uh, he doesn't broad stroke humanity. He doesn't broad stroke groups of people. He doesn't broad stroke churches. He doesn't broad stroke communities. Uh, Everything is individual. Everything is personalized. Everything is tailored to uh, one person and tailored to another person. When he came to uh, the Americas and visited the Nephites, uh, he spent time with every one of the multitude. It wasn't okay. You know, he didn't have his press secretary come out and say, okay, Jesus is available for the next 30 minutes. Um, time is ticking, and then uh, uh, pictures and, and photographers and, and uh, you know, okay, he needs to leave. It's been 30 minutes. No, he ministered to the individual. He ministered to each, each person, and that ha that's how he was in his uh, 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 ministry and mortality, but that's how he is today as he ministers to you now. And that's also how he was um, in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he saw – these, uh, I don't know where this is, but um, it's somewhere. It says that he saw each of us individually in the Garden of Gethsemane and that it was a very individual, personal thing in the Garden of Gethsemane where it was each person that he saw and went through their, you know, their life. And it, um, I mean, just everything about Christ was about the individual, about who they were. And, you know. Okay, perfect. All right. So finishing up, um, I, uh, we're we're kind of combining two different things here. Um, this is uh, the apostles uh, looking up into heaven as Christ ascended, uh, but the quote is "Go and do likewise," and that's actually uh, from the parable of the Good Samaritan. Um, so uh, ultimately, that's actually what that's what we should be doing. Um, I. And the, the scripture I have here is, is from uh, um, uh, the book of Acts. But uh, I'm actually not going to read that. Um, we've talked this whole time about the prototype of the saved man. Christ is the prototype of the saved man. Um, I, we can be um, receiving the mysteries of heaven. We can receive prophecy. We can see revelation. We can receive the gifts of the Spirit. But as Paul talked about, if we have not charity, we are nothing. Um, and charity never faileth. Uh, charity suffereth long and is kind, envieth not, is not puffed up, seeketh not her own. Um, charity, uh, the pure love of Christ, is a gift from God. And you think about why it's a gift from God. Uh, we've gone through the suffering that Christ went through. Christ suffered the sins of everyone. He, he knows and can succor anyone. So how can we have charity towards others if we don't know 
what that other person is going through. How can we have the level of love to really soccer them or help them out or just love them? Um, ultimately, like Megan talked about earlier, um, we individually reach a ceiling on our experience and we must receive the gift or borrow from Christ his experience, uh, his mercy, so that we can even comprehend um, what other people are going through. Um, because we live in a, in a world where we experience uh, what we experience and we don't experience what other people experience. Um, but Christ has experienced everything um, and he is the prototype. So as we uh, become meek and lowly of heart, um, uh, we can uh, receive the blessing of charity uh, so that we can truly have love for other people like Christ. Well said. So we must go and do likewise. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you. This was uh, our podcast on meek and lowly of heart. Appreciate it.